Praise the Lord. You may have your seats. Amen. I am so happy to be here. I just can't even contain myself. Um, I give thanks, honor, and glory to God, who's the head of my life. You know, you got to start out proper. You know, you come to a Pentecostal church, you just can't be half step, and you just can't get up any kind of way. Amen. You got to talk about Jesus first before you talk about anybody else. Amen. But I bring you greetings from Imani Community Church and our pastor, the Reverend Dr. George C.L. Cummings. He texted me earlier this morning and he said, oh, yeah, God bless you as you preach. I wish I could be there. But you know he can't be there. He's got to be at Imani. So. But I am grateful for him. He is certainly uh, someone who has affirmed my call and you all know being a woman you know that is a big deal because there are a whole lot of pulpits that I can't yet go yeah and yes the devil is still a lie but uh, I am so grateful that he has um, pushed me uh, and challenged me to grow as a preacher without restriction because of gender Amen. And I want to acknowledge my brother, your pastor, but he's my pastor too, Pastor Mike, for, for just, he's pretty cool. I mean, he is a really cool guy. He's one of the first pastors that I met um, that was really doing the work here in the Bay Area, doing that good social justice work, that good work that God has called us to do to look out for the marginalized, the last, the least, and the lost. And so knowing him has been a blessing to my soul. Just watching him work is amazing and encouraging and inspiring. I want to give honor to First Lady Sharice in her absence. Amen. Amen. When I came to the way uh, a few years ago to worship, for the first time, I, I immediately went home and told my husband, Archie, who's here with me today. I said, uh, listen, if we hadn't found Imani first, <laughs> we would have been at the way. I just feel like this is home. What, what Pastor Mike didn't say about me is that I was raised in a Baptist church in Oakland, and then I spent most of my young adult years at a Pentecostal church in Washington, D.C., so, uh, yeah, I, I, got, I, I can just give you a good word, and I can book with the best of them, too. I don't mind running around the four walls of the church. I don't mind running around the church for the Lord. So that's just something you should probably know before I get started. All right. All right. Oh, and I also want to shout out um, Sister Lauren. Yes, 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 yes. Because not only is she amazing, I know that you know that she's amazing as your worship leader here, but she is amazing at what she does at her day job. <laughs> she actually teaches at my son's school. And so she is one of their teachers. And I'm telling you, the arts program there is super, super dope because of this young woman right here and all of her hard work. Yes. And teacher Madeline is here. She's my son Gabriel's third grade teacher. She's dope too. So it just makes my heart glad to know that my children are in the hands of folks who also love God during their school day. Amen. That's a big deal right there. All right. So come on with me and let's look to the word. All right. I want you to uh, take out your Bibles and take a look at Luke chapter 24. And you may have it in your Bibles or on your device. And is it the custom in this house to stand for the reading of the word? Or, well, I mean, you know, well, I mean, you know, y'all can stand. I'm not gonna force you to stand. I'm not that kind of preacher. I'm not that churchy, I mean. But anyway, so that's Luke 24. And we'll be looking at verses 13 through 21. When you've got it, say, I've got it. I've got it. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, 
about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Let's pray. Almighty God, won't you send your spirit? God, I have prepared, but it won't mean anything unless your spirit comes to illuminate the truth of this word. So God, be with us. Open every heart and every ear. And that after we have done preaching and, and thinking through this thing, Lord, that we'll be somehow transformed, that we'll be somehow better. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may have your seats. I want to talk to you just briefly on the subject. When it seems like hope is gone. The story is commonly known as the road to Emmaus, and it takes place on the afternoon of the day of the resurrection. Here we find Cleopas and a man whose name is unknown to us, and these two men, they weren't a part of the original 12 disciples, but they had followed Jesus and had some firsthand knowledge of Jesus' teachings and miracles. Looking further down in your text in verses 22 and 24, we learned that these two men were present with the disciples and with the other folks when the women suddenly burst into the room saying that Jesus had risen, that Jesus wasn't in the tomb. Now, like the others in the room, Cleopas and his friend thought that the women were telling what the Bible calls an idle tale. Luke's gospel records that upon hearing the news of Jesus' resurrection, some of the men jumped up to go to the tomb to see for themselves if what the women had said was really true. But they too found out that Jesus wasn't there. So this news kind of threw the men into a state of disbelief and a state of confusion. Jesus, this Messiah that they had hoped for, had been crucified, and now his body was missing? Could he really be resurrected? Or did somebody take his body? In the middle of all the wondering and worrying, Cleopas and this guy do a curious thing. They decide to go for a walk. They took the seven-mile walk from Jerusalem, which would be about two hours if they're just strolling, around, strolling along. And they went towards the town of Emmaus. Now, scholars aren't sure why they chose Emmaus. Why there? But the name Emmaus means warm springs. So it's quite possible that there were Roman-style baths there. And it's widely thought that either Cleopas or his friend may have lived in that town because verses 28 through 30 indicate that they had some place to stay. But all of this is purely speculation because the text offers no uh, real rationale for why they took this walk. But I got to wonder why they did that. You would think that they would stay close to the disciples in case Jesus really had risen from the dead and he would probably show up somewhere near the disciples, right? If Jesus really was 
risen, why would they walk further and further away from the place where he was most likely to show up? But maybe they just couldn't take the waiting around. Maybe it was all too much. Maybe they were trying to distract themselves from the myriad of emotions they must have been feeling at that time. And so they walk and they talk. And as they do, this stranger appears. Now, this is a stranger to them, but Luke lets us know that this is actually Jesus. And Jesus roll up alongside of them on their journey. He asks, hey, hey, what y'all talking about? <laughs> so the two men laid out the story of Jesus, the miracles, the healings, all of the teachings. They also lay out the story of the crucifixion. If you look at verse 20 in the text, they told the stranger exactly how they were feeling about all that had happened. They said, our people, our folks, they did this to him. They were the ones that turned him over. It was them. Somehow I think these two dudes were feeling betrayed. Verse 21 shows that they were disappointed. They said, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. They were traumatized because their hope had been nailed to a tree and died a horrific and agonizing death. And not only that, they were probably scared too because if they did it to Jesus, somebody who hadn't done anything wrong, what would happen to them. So if we, if we put ourselves in their shoes for just a moment, they had to be experiencing a whole lot of feelings. They were angry. They were traumatized, disappointed, fearful. And now, now they get the news that Jesus' body is missing. It was too much. It was simply too much. They had to get away from Jerusalem. So they went for a walk. If we're honest with ourselves, right, there are probably a few of us in this room ex who have experienced crushing disappointment before in their lives. Amen. Somebody been disappointed, been hurt, traumatized by something in your life before. Right. And so, and, and, and if you haven't yet, as the old season saints say, keep on living because one day you will. But if we're honest with ourselves, you know, we could say, oh, we had hoped that we could get past this issue in our relationship. But now we don't even speak to each other. Or somebody can say, oh, well, we had hoped that there would be justice this time. You see, somebody caught that thing on tape where they abused that guy, you know, and they shot him. And even the chief of police said, it was, it was a poor misconduct by the officer. We had hoped there would be justice. There would be charges this time. But internal affairs still cleared the officer. And most certainly, we can all say that we had hoped that having eight years of the president that we just had would mean something different for us as a nation. Yet here we are. We had hoped. Many of us have had circumstances where we listened to God speak. We answered God and we submitted ourselves to God's will. Yet that thing still didn't work out. And we say, God, why I trusted you? I don't understand this. I feel like my, listen, my hope, my hope, my hope is gone. And perhaps like these two men in the text, we've needed something to help us process our trauma. Your pain and disappointment will often drive us to distraction. Last summer, um, Solange released a record called Cranes in the Sky. Y'all know that record? And in an interview in Vanity Fair, y'all been putting that on repeat, huh? Y'all know that song. In an interview, I believe she did with Vanity Fair, she was asked about the lyrics to the song, and she said she wrote it to reflect the ways that we, and in particular, black 
women use material things or temporal experiences to distract ourselves from the very real ways that we experience trauma, right? right? And rather than centering ourselves in God and in God's creation. Check out the lyrics. She said, I, I tried to drink it away. I tried to put one in the air. I tried to dance it away. I tried to change it with my hair. I ran my credit card bill up, thought a new dress would make it better. I tried to work it away, but that just made me even sadder. I tried to keep myself busy. I ran around in circles, think I made myself dizzy. I slept it away. I sexed it away. I read it away, away. Away, 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 away. Solange is right. Because when pain comes, we naturally want to do whatever we can to avoid it, to find some way to make ourselves feel better. Somehow we got to fool ourselves into thinking that that pain actually went somewhere else. But in actuality, each time we avoid dealing with it, we're moving further away, 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 away from where we're supposed to be. Sometimes we find ourselves on our own road to Emmaus. Or we're find our, finding ourselves driven to distraction, like Solange sang about. But today I want to invite you to consider just three observations we can make from this text. Jesus gave these two men on this road dialogue, discipleship, and deliverance. What you say, minister. The first thing is, in this moment, Cleo and his cat are laying out their hearts and they're crushing disappointment. But Jesus actually invited them into a dialogue. He had heard them talking and simply inserted himself and said, hey, what y'all talking about? While these two buddies were doing the right thing and talking through their sorrows with one another, they were actually talking to the wrong people because neither one of them was in any position to counsel the other, because they were both in the same boat. And don't get me wrong, don't, don't, don't get it twisted. It's okay when you have hurt and disappointment to seek out someone else, a friend to talk to, to make sense of things. But over time, we don't need to keep coming to the same uh, person seeking the listening ear or advice if they're in the same boat as we are. The song says, what a friend we have in all our sins and griefs to bear, right? What a privilege to carry, what? Everything. Everything to God in prayer. Talk to Jesus. Jesus is actively inviting you into conversation and to dialogue. When it seems all hope is gone, that's the time when your prayer life needs to be on fleek. That is the time when Jesus has thrown you out a lifeline, pour out your heart. Jesus can handle it. But just like Cleopas and his amigo, Jesus is waiting to journey with you. Now, let me pull over to the side for a moment. Got to pull over to the curb because there's something important there. I saw in your announcements that you all have mental health services available for folks. That is such an amazing thing because in the church is one of the places where you can find the most folks who are in need of mental health services. So if you're in a place where you feel depressed beyond just a few days or a few weeks, or if you can't remember the last time you felt like yourself, you need to seek out a licensed therapist. Somebody that can help you in your area of concern. Because listen, the stigma is real. 
And I've said it before in, in different preaching engagements I've had, mental health, is there should be no stigma attached in getting help. God wants us to live life in that more abundantly. That's every area of our lives. You're not saved to be bound by this. God wants you, be t- you to be delivered in every single area of your life. You know, I need to tell you about a situation I had many years ago. Um, I was a director of a group home for teen moms and their kids. And one afternoon, one of the moms was um, having some issues. And she broke one of the more serious uh, infractions of the house. And I had, I had to give it to business. I had to give it to her. Um, and then she proceeded to go into her room and attempt, com- attempt to commit suicide. And she was unsuccessful, unsuccessful, excuse me. But it took a huge toll on her and her child. And walking with her through those weeks and months in the aftermath of that, that thing took a toll on me. I felt guilt because I had to, to, to administer discipline to her. And that was the thing that tipped her over. And I felt like as the person who saw her every day, that I should have been more sensitive and more aware of her, her mental health status. And maybe I shouldn't have been as hard on her. So I was carrying a whole lot of stuff, a whole lot of stuff. And it began to impact the ways that I was interacting with the other residents of that home. But one of the best things that could have possibly happened in that situation is my boss. She said, girl, we're calling in a therapist. We're calling in some help. And over six weeks, we had someone come in and she met with me and other members of the staff to give me a way to get rid of that guilt and to just talk it through. Because see, I'm a praying woman. I could pray, I could could touch heaven. But in that moment, what I was going through, the the pain and the guilt and the sorrow I was feeling was too much for me to see clearly. And so what that did for me is it helped me in my walk with God. It helped me be a better director of the program. It helped me just be a better person. So what's my point? My point is that there is no shame. There is no shame in seeking help. Too many folk in our community, too many folk in our churches are dying. Suffering in silence, coming to church week after week, looking good, smelling good. They driving good. You think they living good. But the truth is, you can't church it away. You can't pray it away. You can't shout it away. You can't fast it away. You can't serve it away. Away, away, away. That is not going to work. Seek help. Sometimes you need to stop trying to distract yourself so much and lay down on the couch of a good licensed therapist and allow God to minister to you through that dialogue. Uh Uh-huh. And get that healing. God has anointed some wonderful folks with the gift of healing through therapy. If you work, you got insurance, talk to your insurance provider. If you don't, Alameda County got that money. (laughs) Alameda County Behavioral Health Care Services, you can Google it and then click on the link. And they will tell you how you can get free or reduced cost service. I'm telling you, there's no reason why you have to suffer alone. So the bottom line of it is that Jesus wants to enter into dialogue with you. Second thing we can observe from this text is discipleship. After hearing the sorrows of these two men, the text tells us in verse 27 It says, then reading with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. On this walk, Jesus reminded Cleopas and Dude of all the things said in scripture for telling his arrival 
his life, his death, his resurrection. Jesus took time to reaffirm everything that they had already been taught about him. All of the miracles, all of the signs and the wonders. He discipled them again. Sometimes we can get so focused on our troubles that we forget who God has been to us in the past. We can forget what we know about Jesus in a heartbeat. Let the situation look bad enough. So when we get into situations where we're hurt or disappointed, we need to turn to the presence of God and allow God to remind us of just how good God has been to us in the past. And that way we can see, God, if you've done it before, I know you can do it again. Sometimes our memories get a little short, and I just praise God that God is patient with us. And we'll bring that thing back to remembrance. Remember how I delivered you that time when your tuition was due. And look, that, that financial aid lady was saying, hey, listen, there's no money here for you. You need to come back. Well, the, the class start yesterday. And you had to pay for your housing. Come on, somebody. And, and that last uh, cup of noodles, yeah, you ate that last, <laughs> last night. That was gone. That was gone. It's gone. There are situations and circumstances in our lives that God just has to remind us of to keep us in the middle of our trials and to help us remember, you know what? So it's those moments of discipleship that God uses to help us to see our way forward on the journey. And then there was this third thing that happened in the text. The third thing was a moment of deliverance. What are you talking about, preacher? Look at verse 28. It reads, as they came near to the village to which they were going, he, meaning Jesus, walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, stay with us because it's almost evening and the day is almost over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and Jesus vanished from their sight. They went to have dinner. They went to have dinner in this Place And in this intimate moment of dialogue and discipleship, Jesus revealed himself to them. Jesus, Jesus delivered Cleo and his partner into a new way of thinking about the situation. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, first off, deliverance happens in moments of intimacy with God. The opening of their eyes and the revelation of Jesus' presence didn't happen out in a public place. No, no, it happened behind closed doors. We can't expect to get our deliverance from God just waving at Jesus from 10 to 12 every Sunday morning in the sanctuary. We just can't. I mean, it, it takes more than that. You have to do more than just be in the building or be around saved folk. Jesus wants to get you alone and in an intimate space. So our deliverance comes from spending time with the Lord in dialogue and in discipleship. Sometimes deliverance comes from Jesus changing a situation. He can change his circumstance. That financial aid check could come. It could, and you'll be delivered, and you'll be good at least until the next semester. And you start all over again. Um, but oftentimes, our deliverance comes when Jesus opens our eyes to a new way of thinking about our circumstances. So at the start of this dialogue with Jesus in verse 21, Cleo and his man said, listen, we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. Even though during the ministry of Jesus, 
he had explained to the disciples time and time again that his kingdom was not of this world. Those who followed Jesus still expected Jesus to overthrow the Roman government and to take his seat on the throne of Israel. He, they still had expectations that it would be something. They had their own idea of what Jesus meant. But the reality of the text is Cleo and his homie never did get to see Jesus redeem Israel the way that they thought, the way they had hoped. As a matter of fact, if they lived out the rest of their lives following Jesus, and they lived anywhere in the Roman Empire, it's likely that they lived under the constant threat of persecution and oppression. So no, it didn't work out like Cleo when his bro had hoped. But you know what? Jesus' death and resurrection worked out beyond anything they could have ever have possibly hoped for. Jesus' death paid the ultimate sacrifice once for all time that not only would Israel be, would be redeemed, but that all of us, the entire world forever, could be redeemed. That whosoever would believe in Jesus wouldn't die, but they would have everlasting life. Jesus' resurrection made it so that he could redeem not just Israel, but everybody. So no, nah, it didn't work out like Cleo and his dude had hoped. It worked out infinitely better. So what does that tell us? Sometimes in our lives, things are just not going to work out the way that we hope. The Bible tells us that God's ways are past finding out. We cannot know the whole mind of God. We just can't. We can't. Because if we could, what would we need God for? If we could figure it out, why would we need a savior? Why would we need a deliverer? Why would we need Jesus? Why? And so, no, not everything in our lives is going to work out the way that we hope. You know, and, and many times that is well, all the time. That's a good thing. If I could just talk about myself. Listen, there are folks whom I thought would be with me at this juncture in my life. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. But when I look at this fine man right here, <laughs> I'm so glad that it didn't work out the way I had hoped, but it worked out the way God intended. So, no, it's not always going to work out like we had hoped. But if we spend time with God in dialogue and in discipleship, God can open our eyes and deliver us into new ways of thinking about our circumstances. So, really, that's all that I have to say this morning. You know, I, I know that I had longer to preach, but, but I feel like that's what the Lord wanted to deposit this morning. So, listen, pain and disappointment, they're going to come. They are guaranteed along this journey. But I simply stopped by this morning to remind you that God is always extending an invitation to engage you, to talk to you. God just wants to be there with you. The way that God loves us, we just cannot even fathom how much God wants to be with us just to talk with us. You know, folks get sick of us talking about the same things over and over and over again, but God never gets tired of us, never gets tired of being with us, being in our presence. And so if you find yourself this morning, with a heavy heart, if you find yourself with a situation that you don't know how it's going to work out, if it seems like your hope has gone this morning, I just want to pray with you for a moment. Won't you stand if you're able?
God, we, we love you so much. We're thankful, Lord, that you love us enough to help us on this journey. We thank you, Lord, that we are never alone. That you are constantly wooing us and drawing us closer to you. Jesus, on this morning, there are folks in the room that have circumstances, Lord. Their hopes seem like they're gone, Lord. They have been hoping for something, Lord, and it seems like that thing is not going to happen. God, things are not working out as they had planned. Oh, God, but this morning we know that you are a God that is present. God, we thank you that you're extending yourself to us this morning to just engage in a moment of dialogue. So right now, God, I pray for every heart in this room, Lord, that they would open their hearts right now, Lord, to hear the ways that you are speaking to them. God, we know that you are yet with us. But sometimes we forget, Lord, all the things that you've done for us in the past. So right now, God, I ask that your Holy Spirit would bring to mind and bring to the remembrance of those who are downtrodden in their hearts this morning. Bring to their remembrance, Lord, how you delivered them out of situations and circumstances in the past. God, send your Holy Spirit to remind them of the ways that they felt then and the way that they felt when you yet delivered them. God, help them to be reminded that you were always, 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 always on their side and in their corner. God, won't you open their eyes and deliver them into a new way of thinking about their current circumstances? God, that they would not just be stuck on their hopes, Lord, but they would be transformed by the renewing of their minds even now, God, and into a way of thinking, Lord, that allows you to be the head of their lives. God, we know that you're able. And so we ask you, Lord, we ask you for it right now in the name of your precious son, our deliverer and our redeemer, Jesus. Let the people of God say amen, amen, amen.